It's about strategy. It's about results. It's about finding ways to take action and make progress in your career and life. Hello, everyone. I'm Brandi Balmarana, and you are listening to Leadership Elevations Radio. We're broadcasting from the Delaware Valley on WNJC 1360 AM and live internationally on www.takeitorleadit.com. You can also visit our radio show tab and click the button. You can search WNJC on shoutcast.com to live stream from your computer, laptop, or tablet. You can also listen to our show on your mobile device by downloading the TuneIn app. Just search Super 1360 to listen to the show. I want to hear from you, so call me live in the studio at 856-227-1360 to join the conversation. You can also tweet me at Brandy M. Baldwin with questions, or you can text me at 215-821-8222 with questions or comments about the show. Leadership Elevations Radio is all about awakening the spirit of leadership in all of us. Whether you're a leader by title or by character, every day is an opportunity for you to elevate your leadership. Walk to the beat of your own drum, color outside of the lines, think and live outside of the box. In this world, we have enough followers. Today, make the choice to be a Whatever you need to do, change, adjust, grow, develop, but in everything that you do, elevate. Now for the next power hour, I want you to come into my world, get a snack. You may even need a pen and a paper, but get ready for Leadership Elevations Radio. For those of you who don't know a lot about who I am, I am the Chief Elevations Officer at Urban Consult. You can go visit us um, on our website at ideasactionprogress.com. It's all about having great ideas, but also taking action on your ideas so that you can make progress in your life, your business, and your career. Today, I'm excited to have Michael Ballard um, on our show today. He actually is a positive outcomes expert. He helps deliver actionable solutions to companies, organizations, and individuals who are going through issues, challenges, Think about it. How do you deal with adversity? How do you deal with change? How do you deal with those overwhelming situations and stresses? Well, Michael will be here this hour to talk about what he does through his company, Resiliency for Life. Michael, thank you for being on the show. It's indeed an honor to be here. Absolutely. And you know what? Before we get started into what you do, I'd like to do a little icebreaker with all of our guests on the show. It'll take a minute or two. Are you up for it, Michael? Yes, indeed. All right. So I have seven questions for you um, so that we can all get to know you a little bit better. So question number one, I want you to repeat to um, complete the sentence. When I was a kid, I wanted to be blank when I grew up. I wanted to help people. I wanted to teach them. I wanted to help them learn how to solve, solve their own problems. Wow, so you wanted to be a helper. Before, so my second question, repeat, I mean complete this sentence. I will never forget blank. I will never forget several of my public school teachers and high school teachers who took me under their wing because school was something I did my best at and didn't always pass. Wow, I love that. Miss Patton in grade one within three weeks told my parents that Michael has exceptional gifts in the classroom and in the playground that will serve him well once he gets out of school. He's not going to do well in school unless something miraculously changes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Okay, what about this next question? I want you to complete the sentence. The advice I'm glad I never took was what? Oh. I should uh, go into commission sales in advertising. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you didn't take that career advice. Mm-hmm. Okay, next phrase. The toughest decision I ever made was? Oh, several of those. But the biggest one was to go for, it was a non-business issue, was to go for a major cancer surgery. I had two choices, the small nip and tuck, save my life, but I'd have to have extensive more, or the big nip and tuck and have extensive but less later. So I went for the big one up front. Wow. Okay, so here's another one. I'm most happy when? Oh, uh, time with family or volunteering, helping others. Okay, good. Two-part answer. 
And my favorite leader is. Oh, jeez. I don't have one favorite leader because I, 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 I like and respect so many for so many different reasons. I'm going to go back in time and say the minister of my church when I was 15. He was very inclusive. And he was good at bringing different ages, both genders, and different income groups together. Okay, good. And then my last one is, one word to describe me is? Enthusiastic. Okay, I love it. So before we really get into um, hearing all that you have to offer, because I know you're all about education um, and elevating, I want to just real quick, briefly remind everyone what you do. Okay. Michael Ballard is a positive outcomes expert. He works through his company, Resiliency for Life, and he's helped over two organizations across North America. He's helped organizations in Bermuda and Singapore, and he has dedicated his life to helping others prepare for or recover from life's challenges. He offers actionable solutions through, ref through reflection and his experiences. He, he helps you to apply a practical yet science-based approach to instill a courageous point of view. I totally love that about what you do. So tell me a little bit about your role as a positive outcomes expert and what you do. Okay, well, there's uh, two or three examples I'll give you. I work for a small, high-technology firm, under 250 staff, and they only ship three to five units a year of their technology. And each unit is in the uh, eight or nine figure range, so it's very important that things be very precise. And they ship them around the world, and they, they get shipped as dozens of pieces, and their staff go over and assemble them. And uh, they'd gone through uh, a rearrangement, and as technology changed, they'd gone through a realignment, new investors, the usual things in high technology. And at one point, they brought in a team to, oh, I'm trying to use the, use the right words, downsize to be blunt, realignment of corporate skills and investments, etc. And it wasn't handled with the greatest tact. You know, it's one thing to do a downsizing in a major city where there's dozens of jobs going for hundreds of people and so there's a chance you'll get something in a few months. But if you do it in a rural community where it's the job, the only job, there, people have to move and do a lot of things. Well, it wasn't handled with the tact that I think that people deserve. So one of the people brought an unloaded, no, no firing pin in, but they brought a weapon to work. No bullets, no firing pin, but still emotionally very scary. So I was brought in at the nine month mark because they were still having a 27% absentee rate. And so I interviewed more than two dozen of the staff at all levels. We talked about the pain and the angst and the sleepless nights, and that I not only lost the coworker from he got fired because of that behavior, but 27% absentee rate, the company wasn't going to be around a whole lot longer unless they fixed it. So well, it was very interesting to talk to these people who showed genuine concern for the man who'd gone over the top and yet <laughs> recognized that 27% of them weren't coming to work regularly. So well, we sat down and we talked about... Uh, opportunities and options to learn and grow and that the fear was normal, not nice, and that uh, the psychologists and the social workers had done their best, but it hadn't changed the absentee rate, and that healing from a big upset like this takes time, and the logical person is just suck it up, buttercup, and keep going, and for some people, it's very easy to suck it up and keep going, but for others, it's less so, and some people were at a tipping point that had other violent incidents in their life, so... What we did was we gave them a series of small digestible training sessions. And by that I mean they were two and a half to three and a half hours long. We did some in the evening so they could do it during their time off if they were feeling so stressed they couldn't take time off from their work to attend a training session. And we invited spouses and uh, youthful children. So 13 and up could also come with their parents and take the courses in the evenings. Because we wanted an integrated approach because as the, the manager and the CEO and the chairman of the board said, at the rate we're going, we're out of business, so a few thousand dollars for training extra, if it works, is well worth it. And so we got people to sit down and do some very powerful work about how they wanted to define themselves in a perfect world. If there was a picture of them in the dictionary, 
what does it look like? What are the words and phrases? And so we did, I won't call it group therapy because I don't believe it is, but we did some real basic groundwork about getting them to redefine and redesign how they saw themselves in the workplace for the future. And then we sat about, sat down with them and said, so let's talk about how we're going to get there. And some of it was real simple. It was getting them over their fear and back out into the community. Because some of them had gone to work, gone home, gone to work, gone home. They were so scared and they caught some bad social mental habits since the issue had happened. And, you know, within six months, we had absentee rates lower than when we before the incident. And it was just a series of talking to them, letting them be heard, acknowledging them, bringing their spouses in to support them, letting them know about the valuable resources in the community, and let's move forward. Let's make some choices. Because I am not a post-traumatic stress expert. As I say to people, I'm a tour guide into the land of how to be more resilient as an individual or as an organization, as a family, as a community. And I'm here to show you options. And as soon as they knew they had options on how to cope and that having fear or panic attacks was not nice but very normal, one guy said, bloody beep, 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 he said. All this time for nine months, I thought there was something wrong with me. <laughs> I said, no, there's something very right about you. You're very alive. So that was one of the things I did for a group that was both sad that it was exciting to help them find their way back and get on with life. Cause and, and you know what, Michael? I love that story because, and especially with us coming out of the holidays, there are so many people who are coping with maybe losing a loved one or maybe they lost a job and so they weren't able to have the the Christmas or the holiday that they are used to having or yep. you know there's so many things that um, many people are struggling with and with my background in psychology like you said I I know we're both familiar with PTSD although that's not specifically what you do in your area but um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, you know some ways that people can learn how to cope and manage and not not only that but thrive and grow um yes. and, and really build their resiliency and um we'll do that right after this quick break today we're talking about resiliency if you're anyone who has ever dealt with adversity or change and maybe you're trying to figure out how to better manage and cope with everyday stresses whether it's on the job or in your personal life this is the show for you we'll be back right after these messages in need of a motivational speaker for your next event? Reach out to Rod Cologne. He has a unique perspective on what it takes to succeed in today's global economy. He has over 25 years of experience as a corporate human resources management insider, agency recruiter, master networker, motivational speaker, and executive coach. As an in-demand motivational speaker, Rod demonstrates the power of networking as a giving and sharing activity and aggressively challenges professionals to be relentless in building their networking skills while managing their careers as a business, the CEO of me. To find out more information on Rod Cologne Consulting Services, go to www.rodcologne.com. Is your company in need of a fresh perspective in dealing with conflict resolution? Are your leaders feeling overwhelmed and constrained by overcommitment? Are you personally struggling to manage your business relationships? Are you an entrepreneur at an impasse? Thick Pens Professionals, a distinctive professional development company, can help you by creating systems and strategic plans customized to address the specific needs of you and your business. Positively impact your team's productivity, better manage your day-to-day, -day, and break the barriers between you and ultimate success. Thick Pens Professionals, conveniently and in-person programs to fit the needs of our clients. Contact us at 1-877-635-9675 or visit the website at www.thigpro.com. Call today and receive a complimentary clarity session at 1-877-635-9675. Thick Pens Professionals, infusing work-life balance in business. You're listening to Leadership Elevations Radio, sponsored by PhD Trainers and powered by www.takeitorleadings.com. Well, 
Welcome back to Leadership Elevations Radio. I'm Brandy Bowen Rana, and today we're speaking to Michael Ballard. He is a positive outcomes expert. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about his work with organizations and helping them to overcome stressful um, situations. And Michael, I wanted to talk to you during this segment about how individuals can learn how to manage and cope with their stressors, um, but then also take it a step further and move into really thriving and growing um, again and moving beyond their life circumstances that may be stressing them out. Right, right. Well, one of the team leaders I worked with a few years back, Gail, was really good at doing it both personally, but she incorporated it into her, her career position and she invited both her team and her suppliers to join her. So when we were in meetings or doing training with her or doing other things, she would look around and say, you know, nothing to do with this group, but I got some stuff going on. Today, I'm going for a walk and a talk. Who's in? Mm, I love that. Oh, so this wasn't jogging. This wasn't running. This was a moderate to brisk walk, but she would just talk about life. Because she said, some things I deal with are personal. And uh, I know she did a lot of volunteering work with a crisis center. And so she had things that uh, she couldn't confide in us, fair enough. But she would say, you know, a little exercise and a talk with somebody you trust and respect is so good for the soul. And so some people at first were scared when she would look at them and say, I'd really value your input. Can we do a walk and a talk? But I didn't meet anybody who didn't say, you know, a walk and a talk with Gail is spectacular. Fast enough that it's a little bit of exercise, and yet slow enough that even though I'm not in perfect shape, it was okay, but there was this sense of sharing and caring and nurturing and tough questions when it was your turn to share. So she really wanted to commit to be connected with people. And so I found that to be one of the healthiest parts of the organization when I was there because Gail was really good with her walks and talks because we all went out with Gail for a walk and a talk and uh, you were free to ask her and sometimes she said yes and sometimes she said no depending on what was on her plate. So that was something small but large in that she could have done the team leader, I'm a manager, I have an office with two windows, I'm going to lock myself down at lunch, don't disturb me. But instead, several days a week, she'd say to Brandy or Michael, can we do a walk and a talk? Sometimes it was about parenting, she'd share a little something, and sometimes it was about work or a supplier, or sometimes it was about politics. But it was so affirming to spend time with Gail when she did that. I love that. I totally love that story because, you know, uh, you know, we're so busy at work. I mean, I was talking to um, one of my family friends earlier today and he was like, you know, I don't even get a chance to eat lunch sometimes on certain days. But yes. from a leadership perspective in terms of setting the tone and not just having everything be a formal meeting or meet me in my office. Hey, if you are going to go out and get some fresh air, um, inviting one of your colleagues or someone that you are managing on your team to come out outside side of the office setting to uh, talk about whatever it is. I think that's great in terms of relationship building relationships um, in terms of sort of the psychology of how humans work relationships that that's the glue that sort of binds us together. We, we want to be connected and feel connected with others. So I love that sort of anecdotal story that you and told about. Go out of a way to find out what your favorite comfort food was. As right. Is. And yes. she quickly found out that yours truly love grilled cheese sandwiches. And <laughs> <it is> soup. <laughs> that was my favorite too. But I, yeah, I totally love that. And in sort of, you know, a, a non-conventional way to connect and, and provide a space for people to talk about whatever may be on their mind. Um, and, 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 and she did it well. She, you never felt trapped. You never felt, and she would, on a hot summer day, she say, let's not walk along the sidewalks. There's no shade. Let's walk along the trees. The terrain's a little rougher, but we'll just go slow. So unless it was 20 below, or let's see, 20 below Celsius, let's see if it was uh, 7 above, 7 Fahrenheit, you, know, you would walk in all sorts of weather. And uh, they, were, they were great talks. I miss them. 7 Fahrenheit, that's awful cold. Uh, I'm not sure if our listeners are cool. is calling in today from Canada. Where specifically are you again? I am in the city of Toronto. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I'm like seven. We, we shut down all the schools so, here if it was seven degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, Michael, I wanted to just ask you a question, you know, for people who are, you know, let's let's keep moving forward with sort of sure. in, 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 in a work setting. I kind of like where you're going with this. If, you know, and many people, they dread 
going into their job. Tomorrow is the first day back for a lot of us that have been on break for the holidays. And yes. some people, they're already starting to feel the anxiety, the stress. You know, what do you recommend in terms of trying to have a fresh and a new start um, with folks that maybe their job is stressful or maybe there are stressors outside of their job, but either way, they're not looking forward to that. But that has a negative effect on the organizational culture and those relationships. Sure so in terms of being resilient and starting the year off fresh, what do you recommend for people who are maybe not looking well, forward to going back to work tomorrow? This is easy to say, and it's not always easy to do. And for those that are in the parent zone, it's even more so. My children have left the nest a while ago. So yeah, I have a I have a six year old um, and an infant. So yeah, my 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 little birds are still in the nest. So talk yeah. to me. I'm in the parent zone. I just want to acknowledge that. So when I say this, people with parents that are parents still don't go. Oh yeah, easy for him to say. Yeah. But can you leave ten to twelve minutes earlier than you need than you can, so that when you get to work. You're not time pressured. I call it owning my own space and owning my own time. I actually had a couple of coworkers years ago get mad at me because I was happy when I got to work. <laughs> yep. was, you're just too happy. There's something wrong. You don't yes. realize the pressure we're under. I said, well, I have budgets like you. I'm over on some and under on some. And at one point, one person in the organization made a very big error in judgment, and it cost us $35 million for a lawsuit. Mm. So I said... I didn't do anything wrong and you didn't, but that all came out of all our hides because it was what it was. I said, so that going in that little bit early, it gave me a sense of control mm -hmm. and it gave me a sense of, I can do this. And so there, it's real popular in some circles to do gratitude lists. Oh, I love that. And so it's not the end all and be all, but your listeners may or may not know based on what we put up, because pardon me, when we arrange this, I forget what I sent you, but I must... I'm a cancer survivor a few times. I'm my fourth chance at life. Mm. But by getting there early, it was just a, huh, all sharpened. I'm going to go to the washroom. I'm going to go drop downstairs to shipping and receiving and say hi to the guy that did me the favor last week. Shake his hand. And I would spend it doing relationship things. I would, I totally love that. And, Holy you know, breath. Tell me a little bit, how much does, just, you know, hearing you talk, how much does, does choice have to do with resiliency? Because like you said, oh. you know, your budget is just as bad as maybe someone else's budget. You have some that you're in the blue, I mean, the black, some you're in the red. You know, how much does choice have to do with sort of having a resilient mindset? Well, based on our beliefs, some of us have some sense of control and some of us have no sense of control. So... Having a sense of control by leaving 10 minutes early to get there 10 to 12 minutes early, by arranging with your spouse when I had kids that these two nights of the week, I'm gonna be late. But that means I'll be home early three nights of the week. I can do more parenting. Mm -hmm. So, so on, and, and uh, eventually, when I got higher up, I got to work from home at least one day a week or more. So it was like, hmm, if I do lots of work when the kids are in bed for work, I have time when they're awake to do parenting things. Yes. And uh, even when they were tiny for a little while, I got to have naps with them, which was like, woohoo! <laughs> I'm still waiting for that to happen. Yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> we'll have an off-air chat about uh, relaxation for little toddlers. Absolutely. Wait, so what we did was, I, I, I did all I could to have a sense of control for, for, for travel, and sense of control is big in resiliency. When I get that once a night a month or two nights a month where I can't sleep, I have to ask myself, so what unresolved issue do I have that this is happening for? Is it unresolved and positive and it just hasn't happened or is it unresolved and negative and has to be, you know, put to bed? Because I love that saying from years ago that I've adopted that you can drift, you can dream, you can drown, or you can decide. Mm. And so being in control it's a bit of a fallacy because I could get hit by a bus or a meteor tomorrow. And yet, on the other hand, I can decide matching socks or not matching socks. Yes. And so, some control is really good to give away control. I'm the guy that at the crosswalk slows down so the cars can get through and I don't force them to stop by hitting the button and sticking my arm out because I have the right to cross here. It's like, yeah, 
go, go, go. Then I'll get to push the button. Then I'll go when there's nobody around at all. Or yes. when that car that's way, ways away, isn't, I'm not going to get in his way. It just helps with the flow of the city. It's my, my little game of how do I be a pedestrian. And you know what? I love what you say, you're saying in terms of um, being able to give away control. You know, I'm, I'm a little oh, yeah. bit of a type A personality. Oh. Um, and so, and I like structure. I like to, you know, have my days and my weeks, you know, are mostly predictable. I'm not that spontaneous. Whereas my husband, for example, is almost totally opposite. He's like, go with the flow, you know, everything's yep. going to be all right. But I love the, there's a sense of control to be able to give away control. Um, in the way that you're saying and making a choice to, um, as you said, you know, hey, let the car go by or go into work a little early or, you know, think of these I as mean, really decisions. I got cut off in traffic years ago. Yeah. I had come home from surgery and I was healed and I was back to work, but I was still stressed. You know, I'd had cancer again. Surprise. And so I had made a choice to acknowledge the seriousness of it all. But I also warned my relatives that my sense of humor <laughs> was a little off the wall. Yeah. Hopefully I would only stay respectful of them, but I had no problems making fun of myself. So I said to my surgeon at one point, I've had so many surgeries here that I'm going to change the whole thing. I don't come for surgery anymore. I'm coming in for tune-ups. <laughs> now let's talk about tune-ups and warranties. Do you offer warranties? <laughs> a bumper-to-bumper -bumper plan? <laughs> well, we're at it. I want a frequent stitcher's card. There's a frequent air miles card. I want a frequent stitches card. I've had so many stitches and clips and things. And, oh I, and so my doctor said, you have a remarkable attitude. I said, well, that's my sense of control. Yes. I, I made a choice to have a sense of control about something I have no control over. Both my grandfathers had bowel cancer. And wow. ta-da, guess what I got? So just like work when I had a large client go bankrupt, Surprise, surprise. We didn't see that coming. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, I guess I'm not going to get the bonus that I counted on for my retirement. Uh, mm -hmm. Some niceties around the house and some other things. Hmm. I could be bitter and angry or I could go, I guess my prospecting skills are just going to have to be a little sharper than usual yep. for next year because I need to replace that money. Yep. I love that. I love that. I just, I totally do. And you know what? When we come back, I want to talk to you. I want to talk with you a little bit more about your experience um, with cancer and in, in terms of how that built your own resiliency and how you were able to move mm -hmm. through um, just overcoming that because we all have family members and people that we know that are struggling in terms of health and wellness and with many different things. Right. So I think that'll be um, inspirational for our listeners. Um, if you are just tuning into Leadership Elevations Radio. I am your host, Brandy Baldwin Rana, and we're talking about resiliency for your life. We'll be right back after these messages. Want to make more money while generating more revenue and profitability? Want to know how healthy your business is? Contact Don Anderson for a free diagnosis. Businesses have become extinct because they did not value sales. Don't lose opportunities to competitors. The health of your business is in your hands. You are the person who can initiate the call to action. Don works with companies and salespeople and understands that adapting to an ever-changing business world is necessary to thrive. His programs motivate, rejuvenate, and enhance performance of the entire organization. Don specializes in helping startups and small to mid-sized businesses generate consistent and predictable revenue with affordable, operationalized selling systems while eliminating negative, unproductive patterns. If the survival of your business is at stake, call Don so together you can realize the true potential of your business. For your free consultation with Don Anderson, call 202-689-9200. Is your organization facing the same employee challenges every year? PhD trainers can help. Our team of trainers, consultants, and change agents are ready to help your employees upgrade their professional skills. Work with one of our professional development advisors to develop a customized employee development training for in-service days and company retreats. We guarantee that your team will be enlightened, empowered, and motivated to succeed. Call us today for a complimentary consultation at 866-506-3866. That's 866-506-3866. Visit us online at phdtrainers.com. PhD Trainers, helping organizers harness their inner genius. 
listening to Leadership Elevations Radio, sponsored by PhD Trainers and powered by www.takeitorleadit.com. Welcome back to Career Elevations Radio. I am Brandy Baldwin Rana. I'm sorry, Leadership Elevations Radio for 2015. Okay, Michael, are you still here? I am, I am. So we're talking about resiliency for life, but before we get back into um, more of what you have to offer us, I want you to sort of um, participate with me in a little segment I like to call Take It or Lead It. Okay. So I came up with a little... Um, phrase saying either you're going to take things the way they are or you're going to lead them to where you want them to go. So if you want to take it, that means you're going to leave things the way they are. If you want to lead it, that means you want to exercise some control over the situation and use your leadership skills to take it maybe to the next level. So I have two scenarios for you and I just want to pick your brain and see what you think about things. So The first scenario is, say you are an executive director of a nonprofit and you have a board, maybe 15 people or so. And of course, on boards, they um, people are volunteering their time. They're, They're generally not paid for their time. But say your board is lazy. Some members of the board, they're not really pulling their weight. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. Do you... Take it the way it is and be thankful that you have some people there to help, you know, volunteer when they can. Or do you lead the situation and maybe do something else with your board so that they can step up? I think you would lead it and change it. Meet with your uh, director of the board and sit down and uh, because I've been on a board more than once, several boards actually for charities. And... uh, some people more than pull their weight and are astounding at what they accomplish as a volunteer, more than some of the paid staff in a couple of cases. And then there's those that mean to, but for a host of reasons, can't or won't. I was on a board when one of our members just disappeared. Wow. Yes. And you know what? I find that, you know, I don't know what it is, but I feel that people sort of... They, they feel bad about addressing board members who are inactive um, for whatever reason because they're like, hmm, they're sort of volunteering anyway. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there's, there is a mission and, and vision that needs to be, um, you know, forwarded there with the help of the board. So I'm totally with you on that in terms of leading it. I would think that I would uh, meet with the director of the board and we'd identify who was pulling their weight, who was borderline and who was not, and then see for those that were not. I mean, if there's 15 people on the board, for example, I would suggest that uh, if there's, say, five or six of them that aren't, do we need a board that big? And can we instead make these people special advisors to the board? Mm, I like that approach, right? Because maybe they're, because, they, their expertise is great, but they don't have the time to be sort yes. of active. And so... That way, they don't lose face about leaving the board early, and we still have access to their expertise, and we only ask for five or six special things off them every year, instead of four hours or eight hours or 12 hours a week a month because they were overcommitted. Or they might have their own stuff going on that they haven't shared. I can think of a situation where somebody on the board just sort of kept showing up with a big smile, and something was wrong. Absolutely. Absolutely. Three years later, we found out they'd had cancer surgery and didn't want to tell anybody. Mm, mm, mm. You know, so I can't judge them for not pulling their weight, but we need people to pull their weight when they're there, so. You definitely got to gotta address it, though. You do. I believe you do. And and God bless somebody with 15 people on a board. I, I, <laughs> I was thinking like the same less thing. Than, less than 10. Yeah, boards get bigger and bigger nowadays. Okay, good. So I love your response to that one. I got one more for you. Sure. Say you're um, a leader within an organization and maybe you've been there for many years or maybe you're new, but either way you realize that the mission is kind of stale. It's old, it's outdated, no one really follows the mission. Do you take it and sort of leave it the way it is or do you lead it and you know, start some process to reevaluate the mission? Um, oh, you have to lead it and fix it. Okay. Or heal it. Uh, oh, I love that. Heal it. Oh, I love that. Things can change so fast. And so who knows what the competitors are doing? Who in the company is aware of trends on other continents? 
because it's amazing what's going on somewhere else can show up on your doorstep. I helped a small firm of $20 million a year. They went from being market leaders, both in volume of sales and in profit and many other things, to being number four in six months. Wow. Got refinanced and bought number three, number four, and their number 11th competitor and came out with just an amazing package and stole customers left, right, and center all in six months. And suddenly they uh, weren't going to do $20 million anymore. They were going to be lucky to do five or six. They were going to go bankrupt. So uh, we had them uh, re-articulate who they wear, what they wear, and why they wear what they wear. Why did they even get started? And uh, I got them back into their relationships that they'd had with people for 20 to 50 years. And said, you know, it's nice your competitors have kicked the pins out from under you. But uh, now is not the time to lay down and play dead. We have to revitalize your mission. And what is your mission again? And that particular company specialized in a very, very small niche market for North America. There wasn't a lot of wiggle room. And uh, I said, you get out there. You have military contacts and and you had contracts. You've got other things. Now is the time to push back. You've got an 80-year history. I said... And besides, this might be the wake-up call. You need to uh, double the size of the business in the long term. And, you know, they called me the day after our, 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 our event. And they said, this paid for the whole event of 28 people flowing in from north of, across North America and hotel and everything with one idea. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you're going to lead, you have to have fresh ideas and you have to have fresh intel. You have to create a culture where editors can say, you know, this doesn't make sense to me, but... So whether it's education or whether it's business or whether it's government or healthcare, we need to have a pipeline. And one of my mentors is now 87, and every January they have a gathering of Bill's guys. And I never reported him to it directly, but all his staff knew that he wasn't going around you. He was just going to reach right down to the front lines and have a phone call. <laughs> so, Michael, what are we doing right? What haven't you told us these days? What does my sales man team need to know that the sales team isn't telling them? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So people were scared of him, scared out of their wits if they, if they were not good at connecting. If he didn't respectful, I mean, I just love him to bits. He was like an older brother or, or an honorary uncle. And, you know, sure, he was going cutting through all the lines of who was in charge of what. But he said, I just need some truth. It's pretty lonely when you're the senior VP. And he said, I just want eyes and ears on the ground. No tails, no names. And you'd tell him something, and three weeks later, a little something would change in the company. He said, wow, they don't just listen. They actually do. I love that. And it's all about, it, it just reminds me of sort of, you know, the the overarching value for uh, my company, which is ideas, action, progress. I mean, when you're talking about, um, you know, with the mission statement example, rebranding, revitalizing, rearticulating, having that fresh intel, it's all about change, you know, and being yeah. willing to be open to that change. So I totally, um, I totally love what you're saying. And, and it goes right into um, sort of the next thing that I wanted you to just touch on briefly is, you know, you are, you know, the epitome of resilience because you have survived and thrived through um, having a cancer diagnosis, um, which is, you know, must have been a major life change. So can you just talk briefly about sort of your your process and progress um, through recovery and, and how you discovered your inner resilience through going through that life situation? Oh, yes, yes. Well, it starts with a few things, but I'll go back to what I said earlier. If there was a picture of you in the dictionary that only you could see, highly confidential, but you have full access because it's your dictionary, what are the words, the thoughts, the phrases, the beliefs and values that life has brought to you that you've absorbed and decided are yours? There's three types of those that we have. We have the ones that are the absolute truth. I have big toes and they're smelly. (laughs) <laughs> Silly one, but it's true. Yes. I also have the gift of music. Nobody's going to hire me professionally. Whitney Houston's job was never in jeopardy with me singing in the show. <laughs> but I do have, I'm told, uh, uh, an above average sense of timing. And I used to play the trumpet. And I still, well, I haven't practiced for a while. I used to play the piano with some amount of dignity. 
And if you were going to play, going to have a Christmas gathering, and you wanted a Christmas carol, carol guy, I could whip off twenty-five of them in the evening and get people to join in, from the two-year-old to the eighty-seven-year-old, and make them laugh and feel like they were playing the piano with me. Oh my gosh, I'm a violinist, so we need to get together and. and well, our album is out next week, folks. No, <laughs> we got to do that. And so it was great to have that ability to build community and engage others, and yet I def so that was a great thing to define myself as. Yes. Lucky for me, unfortunate for the man, I had a math teacher who was critically ill and he didn't know it until after he got asked not to teach math by the Board of Education. He died within a year. But he was confused teaching me math. So my marks fell from mid-70s, high, high 70s, to 52 that year. Only time I cut a class in high school was to avoid the math. <laughs> well, if I had believed him and taken him at gospel that I was a lousy math student, I'd have never gone past grade 10 math. So part of our belief system to be resilient is we have to examine our belief system. What is true? What do we think is true? But should we examine? And what is an out, out lie? I talked about off air, or maybe it was on air, I forgot already, about my grade one math teacher, Miss Patton, who was absolutely brilliant. She's long gone. It's been a long time since I was in grade one. But she was loving, nurturing, caring, and held you accountable. But part of being resilient is expectations. Not only what do you believe that's true and what should you throw away because it's wrong about you, but then how do you hold yourself accountable? And how did you do that in terms of examining those expectations and, and having an examination of who you are? How did that help you throughout um, your cancer diagnosis? I decided that I was going to have the least amount of pain that anybody had having a six and a half hour operation and a third of their large or half their large digestive tract cut out. I wasn't sure how I was going to measure it, but I knew I was going to be up, mobile, and I was not going to ever have a beach body again because the scars looked like me and Zorro had a thing. <laughs> Zorro almost lost for the first time ever. Yes. But I was going to have fun with it. So I had theme music. I had uh, a couple of poems. I had, uh, <laughs> I had a joy list. And... I had a sense of physical accomplishment that I had to walk a couple of miles every day once I was able. So I used the Rocky movie and the running up and down the stairs as my visual inspiration. So I set a goal that I was, was going to have to walk upright within a couple of weeks after surgery, and then I was going to have to be able to walk. And three months after surgery, I went to the local YMCA, got in the swimming pool, and uh, I knew I was still able and promptly sank to the bottom. <laughs> I was so underweight. I, was, I lost my buoyancy. <laughs> <laughs> so you could get mad or get scared. I went, wow, I don't ever have to worry about weight loss ever again. <laughs> And you know what? I love what you're saying in terms of, you know, being able to take a step back and set goals for yourself in the midst of the storm, so to speak. Yeah. And, you know, you identified your visual inspiration. That's some easy wins. Yeah, yeah. And it does provide you a sense of accomplishment. Um, I think a lot of times people get so, they sort of wallow, you know, and they can't dig themselves out of their own anxiety and depression and um, self-pity. And when you're, um, you know, you don't really have too much of a choice in terms of you, maybe your physical um, state or your health and wellness, but you have a lot of, a, a lot of um, choice in terms of your mindset. And I totally yeah. love that you, you decided not to be mad or be scared. Um, and and it's, I think it's normal for, for folks to sort of feel those emotions in the beginning. But you know what? I'm going to be happy and I'm going to choose joy. I, I totally love that. Um, we're going to take a quick break. And we only have one more segment left here with Michael Ballard. He is a positive outcomes expert. In all that's happening in your life, there's always a positive outcome. Um, and it's all about being resilient. We'll be right back after these messages on Leadership Elevations Radio. Is your company in need of a fresh perspective in dealing with conflict resolution? Are your leaders feeling overwhelmed and constrained by overcommitment? Are you personally struggling to manage your business relationships? Are you an entrepreneur at an impasse? Thick Pens Professionals, a distinctive professional development company, can help you by creating systems and strategic plans customized to address the specific needs of you and your business. Positively impact your team's productivity. 
better manage your day to day and break the barriers between you and ultimate success. Thick Pens Professionals, conveniently offering virtual and in person programs to fit the needs of our clients. Contact us at 1 877 635 9675 or visit the website at www.thigpro.com. Call today and receive a complimentary clarity session at 1 877 635 9675. Thick Pens Professionals, infusing work life business. Want to make more money while generating more revenue and profitability? Want to know how healthy your business is? Contact Don Anderson for a free diagnosis. Businesses have become extinct because they did not value sales. Don't lose opportunities to competitors. The health of your business is in your hands. You are the person who can initiate the call to action. Don works with companies and salespeople and understands that adapting to an ever-changing business world is necessary to thrive. His programs motivate, rejuvenate, and enhance performance of the entire organization. Don specializes in helping startups and small to mid-sized businesses generate consistent and predictable revenue with affordable, operationalized selling systems while eliminating negative, unproductive patterns. If the survival of your business is at stake, call Don so together you can realize the true potential of your business. For your free consultation with Don Anderson, call 202-689-9200. Listening to Leadership Elevations Radio, sponsored by PhD Trainers and powered by www.takeitorleadings.com. Welcome back to Leadership Elevations Radio. I'm Brandy Ball and Rana, and today we're talking about resiliency, how you can overcome adversity, deal with change, and deal with the overwhelming stresses of everyday life. Um, the person who's joining us today to help you elevate is Michael Ballard. He's a positive outcomes expert. And for this last segment, Michael, I wanted to, you to talk a little bit about faith. Um, I know that's very important to you, and it has to do a lot with uh, your work and also just people being resilient in general. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, one of the things, of course, when big stuff happens, and I call it big stuff because for some people who have gone through some sort of tragedy or trauma, just naming the trauma can set them off. Yes. So big stuff is safe, whether it's a workplace, workplace accident, suddenly getting blindsided and laid off in your job when you were doing really well, or a death of a spouse, whatever. I call it big stuff to keep people feeling safer. So when big stuff happens, it's important to figure out how'd you get here. So it helps you understand certain principles. And I talked earlier in the last segment about if there was a picture of you in the dictionary, how would you define yourself? So I am, to misquote a, a gentleman from the 80s that I met, perfectly imperfect. And so I do my best, but I'm never going to be perfect. So I'm aiming for excellence. And in my walk in faith, that means I treat others with dignity and respect, but I also keep an eye on my my brother because I'm my brother's keeper and he is mine. And so I try to be safe, I try to be respectful, but I also try to be gently uplifting and I don't use a lot of faith words because I work and live in a very multicultural city. Well, I mean, I work all over North America, but for the most part I work in the greater Toronto area and kind of the people that live here aren't practicing Christians. They have other faiths. So unless they want a personal discussion about faith, I uh, just acknowledge that we have faith. Yes. And so going back to my grandparents and their faith, they changed countries because they felt they had a better chance here to raise a family in faith and walk in faith and live in faith because the old world was they came from was not as pleasant. And so they felt that it was a gift to live in Canada. And I was very blessed to live in Canada. So my faith came from a place of safety that four grandparents, two parents, my community. And so it allowed me to grow up with all these pillars of strength around me that reached out and connected. And my uncle who would say, yes, faith's important, but you know what? You also have to learn, it, learn to laugh at your mistakes if you did them with good intent. Because if you get too uptight about it and try to be perfect, you will not be happy. And he said, you gotta be happy. So I was really fortunate to be surrounded by by people who my, allowed my parents allowed them to reach out, and I was honorary uh, 
son to three or four of my aunts and uncles who hadn't had kids, and they'd cut me off for a weekend. And as I used to tease them when I got to be 15, so was I like the test drive, what it was like to have a kid in the house before you had your own? <laughs> <laughs> or was I that bad my parents had to get rid of me for a weekend off? But my faith helped me define who I was. And so my parents would say, so we have a minister coming up this weekend who's famous for his sermons about the war because he lived through the war. He was on the front lines with all the troops and he saw things no human should have to see. So if he talks about the war, you're only nine, but we don't want you to go to, go to Sunday school. We want you to listen. It's boring, but there's going to be some big, meaty stuff in the middle of it all. And sure enough, the canon had big, meaty stuff. When he didn't do a war sermon when he visited, he did a baseball sermon. <laughs> And yet, you know, the rapper, this older gentleman, was, you know, he was old and tired to look at and overweight, but boy, oh boy, did he have things to teach. And so I was lucky to have parents who gave me these, you know, allowed me to see and hear people with different values slightly, but they all in the faith, and to hear them articulated different ways. We had a banker that I grew up with in the neighborhood who gave a great sermon. He was, I wouldn't say stiff, but he was very formal when he presented I'm sure that uh, if he fought, if he had met with the board of directors for the bank, he wouldn't have done changed the thing with his appearance or his delivery style. And yet, at church, stiff and formal, but there was so much love in his delivery that you just had to listen. And so when I was called upon with my challenges with my health and death and dying issues, it was like, you know, Ballard, you have enough faith that uh, you just have to pay attention to those lessons and resurrect them and, and use them. I love what you're saying, too, because faith is it's complete trust or confidence in someone or something. You know, it's that belief in those underlying values. And I think that, you know, just hearing you and being able to share this time with you during um, leadership elevations, I, I can tell that that is a major part of why you are so resilient. and You're able to help um, so many people with really understanding um, how they can be resilient. So I want to thank you so much for being on the show. But before we go, you know, how can we learn more about your work? Where can we find you? Where can we connect with you on social media? Well, you could, if you want to see a little tiny bit about me every day, you can find me on Twitter where I'm Resilient Michael. No L, because they did the old days, they didn't let me have that many letters. So R E S I L I E N T, Resilient Michael, no L on the Michael. Or you can find me on Facebook if you type in Resilient Michael. Or you can find my website, michaelhballard.com. Wow. And you can also go to takeitorleadit.com. We'll have all of Michael Ballard's information up um, soon so that you can, we'll backlink that to your website um, and everything. Thank you so much for being here and just helping our listeners really get a better understanding of how they can be more and more resilient in their life each day. I'm, I'm just so thankful to have you. Well, it's been a blessing to be here. Much for the honor. So... Today was such an inspiring show. The time went by so fast, but I don't want our conversation to stop. I want to invite you to visit me over at ideasactionprogress.com to learn more about what I'm doing and my team of change agents are doing for organizations, individuals, professionals um, here and around the world. Also, we have a mission. We want to awaken the spirit of leadership in everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a leader by title or by character. You can always have take an opportunity to lead your life to where you want it to be during this show you heard a couple commercials and i want to say thank you to our sponsors each week on leadership elevations radio you'll be hearing more about what they do and how they help others these people were handpicked and their companies are serving others um, and helping others elevate their lives as well until next time i am brandy baldwin rana i look forward to um, speaking to you more on leadership elevations radio i'll talk to you soon